So essentially, I guess I would label this a kind of moving average bounce or rejection system here, depending on you know what terminology you like to use there. Um, we can see it's, it, this, although this one is using uh, two time frames and uh, two different EMAs as well. So looking at the screenshot here, yeah, we have a little circled example of a bounce and I would say that this this is probably would be a bounce right here uh, a few a few bars later right there where my cursor is at would be a probably a, another example of another bounce here and when you're considering you know these moving average kind of bounce trades or rejection trades here you know the one thing to consider here is like let's take a look at rule number five here it says previous four candles can't have touched, can't have touched the 18 EMA, right? So, you know, clearly, visually, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, as a human, when you're identifying these kind of uh, bounce patterns here, right? You're looking for price to have moved away from that moving average to some extent, um, right? So we can see that there's, you know, uh, I don't know, about six bars or so where price had kind of moved away from that moving average and then it returns back to the mean. So, you know, so when you're wanting to convert that right into computer language, you know, or convert that into Bloodhound, you also need to take into consideration those those same aspects here where you're you're you needing for it to for it to be a good clean, you know, price bounce off of the moving average, um, you know, as opposed to consolidation, right? So like a little further back, we can see prices just consolidating around the EMAs. And so if you don't take into consideration this price movement away from the EMA for certain number of bars, and this movement could can be measured in two ways, right? So you can measure the distance. So you can say, okay, price you know, the closing price of the bar or, you know, maybe the high of the bar or the low of the bar needs to move away from the EMA, you know, by so many ticks, right? You need so much distance between your moving average and the price of the bar, right? One of the prices on that bar, uh, right? So that distance away can be one measurement. So uh, we don't actually have that measurement um, in uh, David's question here. But another measurement here is that price needs to be needs to have moved away from your from the moving average for X number of bars as well. Right. So you can make sure that X number of bars hasn't touched that moving average as well. Right. So that that's two ways that you can quantitatively measure that the price bars have at least cleared, uh, you know, moved away from the moving average. So that way, when price pulls back towards it you know, you're, you're more apt to get a cleaner bounce off of it, you know, as opposed to generating just kind of garbage random signals when price is consolidating around the moving average. All right. So yeah, with that, I guess let's start building. All right. So first thing I'm going to do is um, open up Bloodhound up here at the top of the chart. And second thing I'm going to do is put a file name in here. So you definitely want to get started by putting a file name in so all your work gets saved back to a file. All right, so I'm going to hit the change button here. So it is September already and cooler weather is beginning, which is kind of nice. Kind of nice to have that cooler weather out. I can open the windows in the house now. Uh, all right, so there's today's date. Uh, next thing, I'm going to start working on the logic tab here and hit the new button and that'll start a new logic template here. So let's see. Let's see. What should we call this here? All right. So I have a EMA 18 and 20 bounce with a 15 minute time frame. So there we go. So we have a name for our logic template here. Now, for most of you guys, see in this workshop, right, I'm I'm usually building multiple examples here for the questions that come in here. 
you know, so I usually get kind of very specific with the logic template names, but normally you would take, you know, this system name and you would actually use that up here for the file name. And then for the logic template name, you would probably just call it, I don't know, entry signal or something like that, something pretty basic, All right? So for you guys at home, that's normally how you would do it. You would want to create a separate Bloodhound file for each of these systems, right? It's 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 a better practice to put each system, you know, that you want to test out or that you want to build, put each system into its own file um, instead of grouping b multiple systems in in the same file. You know, it's better to separate all your systems into separate files that way, and then you can use the logic template here to kind of create multiple derivatives of that one system, right? So your so your your file name might just be like EMA 18 and 20, you know, bounce system or something like that. And then you can use the logic template to create multiple derivatives of this. So maybe you might create one derivative that has the 15 minute time frame and then a second derivative that doesn't have that 15 minute time frame, right? A single time frame as opposed to a 20 minute time frame. Let's see. All right, so we'll just start um, building the solvers for each of these rules one at a time here. So, <clears throat> first one's going to be pretty simple. We're just going to look at the slope of the EMA 18 and EMA 20, right? And make sure that they're just sloping in the right direction. So, we're going to go to the solver nodes here. And we're going to grab a couple of slope solvers here. So I'll click on that, and that drops a slope solver down. And let's connect it up. Let's give this a name. So we'll do the EMA 18 period slope first. So there's a name. <clears throat> and then we'll go into the input and change this to the EMA. There's our EMA. And let's make it an 18 period. Click OK. And uh, yeah, let me let me put my put those EMAs on the chart here. And there we go. Okay. Those two reds are a little easier to distinguish from each other. I'll just make one of these dashed. Now it'll make sense as to what we're seeing here. So, right, so we have a, a slope solver. So whenever the EMA 18, which is the solid line, if it's sloping up, we're gonna have a long output. And if the EMA 18 is sloping down, we're gonna get a short or a red output. All right, so we're gonna take that and let's grab another slope solver. And this one will be the EMA 20. And again, we'll replace the SMA and plug in the EMA. There's our EMA. There we go. All right. Now we're two slope solvers. And if we want to, we could start, um, we can grab an AND node and just start connecting things together. All right, so both of those moving averages, both need to be sloping up together or down together. All right, so, okay, so there you go. That's uh, rule number one here, pretty straightforward. And then rule number two, the same thing, Although we're just going to be looking at the EMAs on the higher time frame, right? So we have a 15 minute higher time frame here. So the five minute is basically the chart, what the chart is. So yeah, I mean, my chart's a one minute. I guess I could switch this over to a five minute. There we go. Okay. So now everything matches up here. So the, the default time frame, right, is the five minute chart. And then we have a higher 15 minute time frame. 
Okay, so let's get Bloodhound back open. Instead of going to the the logic tab here, I'm going to stay on the solvers tab and we're going to add that 15 minute chart. So we're going to click the chart button there and add that 15 minute chart time frame. There we go. So 15 minutes. There we go. And we need the slope solvers for the EMAs on this higher time frame here. So what I can do is I can select one of these solvers, hit the copy button, right? There we go, so it made a copy of it. And then I can use the down button and I can move this solver down onto the 15 minute time frame. So I'm gonna do the same thing for the EMA 20, select it, hit the copy button, select it again just to make sure and then hit the down button and there we go so now I have the EMA 18 and 20 uh, running on the 15 minute chart right on the 15 minute chart there so now I can go back to my logic tab here and I can go to my exit my nodes go to existing nodes and so now you're going to see there's a default time frame and the 15 minute time frame. And so there's the two slope solvers uh, on my running on my 15 minute chart, right? So I'm going to select those and move those down. Go back to the 15 minute. There's the EMA 20 slope. All right, move that down. And you'll notice on top of the solver, it'll tell you the time frame, right? So if a solver is running on some other uh, time frame, it'll right, it'll tell you that on the top of the solver there. And so now we can just take those slope solvers, plug them into the end node. When we go back to our chart, you'll see it says here new new chart added. You know, so we need to reload the chart so that Ninja Trader can build that 15 minute time frame for Bloodhound to use. Right? So that's one thing Ninja Trader does not build time frames on the on the fly. So you'll always have to reload your chart when you add or remove um, a time frame to your Bloodhound system. So, all right, so we'll just uh, simply hit F5 and we get Bloodhound back open again. There we go. All right, we'll just move those up a little bit. And so now we can see on the chart, you know, when when the EMAs, when, when, yeah, when the two EMAs on the two time frames, when they agree and when they do not agree, right? So you can see these, these areas here with no racing stripes, right? The black areas, that is telling you that one of the four EMAs um, is not matching up with all the others. So they're not all synchronized. And so as soon as we get a long output here, the green area, then that tells you that all of the EMAs on both time frames are sloping up together. Okay, so that's uh, rule one and two. Next, uh, rule number three here. So price uh, needs to cross over the EMAs, um, way I would phrase this is price needs to be either above or below the EMAs, uh, right? That's It's not actually a crossover. So if we go back to this screenshot, right? Uh, basically, yeah, price needs to be, you know, below the EMA, right? For a short bounce off that EMA or price needs to be, uh, yeah, like, on the left here, price needs to be above the EMA in order to set up for a long bounce off that moving average. And so actually, um, so rule number three and rule number five are actually gonna be kind of one and the same. They're, they're gonna be, yeah, so, so when we're checking to make sure that we had had four previous bars, you know, that didn't touch the EMA, we'll, we're also going to make sure that, that the price was 
either below or above the EMAs um, at the same same time. So, all right, yeah, so let's, we'll, yeah, basically we're gonna work on three and five um, at the same time here, yeah. So to do that, to check whether, you know, the, the, the bar is above or below some kind of indicator, we're gonna go, first of all, we're gonna do this on the default time frame here, right? We're gonna use the comparison solver, right? So we're gonna compare the, the bar prices to the EMAs. All right, so let's connect that up. And so to make sure, you know, that the bar hasn't touched one of the, the EMAs, you know, we need to, well, you know, what is, you know, what is, what is the definition of a candle? Well, it's the open, high, low, or close prices, right? So if, if the bars are below the EMA, then, you know, we want to be looking at the high of the bar, right? The high wick, the high of the bar. And if price is above the moving averages, then we want to be looking at the low price of the bar, right? That's how we determine whether price is touching, um, right? Is by looking at the high, making sure it's below the EMAs, or looking at the low of the bar and making sure it's above the EMAs. So with our comparison solver, uh, let's see, so for a, a long situation, we're gonna be looking at the low of the bar, and for a short condition, we're gonna be looking at the high price of the bar. And I'm gonna to check to see if it's above or below um, the EMA 18. All right, so input A, that's gonna be the, the bar prices. So we'll set this to price. And so for a long, we're gonna look at the low, low price of the bar and for a short situation, we're gonna be looking at the high price. So typically, uh, typically these prices will be opposite of each other, right? So for a long situation, if you need to use the high price, then typically for the, a short situation, you're gonna be using the low price, right? So once you figured out, you know, what price you're using for a long trade, then almost always for a short trade, you're gonna be using the opposite price there. And put that back to high, there we go. All right, so the input B, well, we're comparing it to the EMA 18. So let's go put the EMA 18 in there. All right, EMA 18, there. All right, so if we yeah, zoom in here and take a closer look, right? If if the candle or the bar, if it's completely above the EMA 18, we're gonna get a long output, right? If we can see that if the bar, right, is touching the moving average, then there's no output, right? And so obviously in so vice versa, if the bar is below the EMA, then we're getting a short output, right? So there you go. So that these, all right, so this, the short or long output is telling us that, right, the bar is not touching the EMA, right? That it's cleared it, so. And now, uh, right, so that takes care of basically rule number three. And so now for rule number five, we wanna make sure that we have at least four bars in a row where price had not touched that, that EMA. And to do that, I can use, um, let's see, let's use, um, yeah, we'll use a, I can use either a signal counter or a look back node. I think it's gonna be better to use a signal counter here. And I'll explain in just a moment here. Let me just 
do a quick test. Actually, no, it, it actually it does not matter. Um, yeah, it, it actually doesn't matter. Well, what the heck? I'll just keep the signal counter um, in here because it was really easy to set up here. So the signal counter, um, I I just set the counting up to four, right? We want to count up to four bars, and our look back period is only going to be four bars, right? Because we uh, basically, you know, what this is looking for is to make sure that there were four bars in a row that were not touching the EMA, right? So for the so for the signal counter, yeah, we're just we we're counting up. We're looking for four bars that we're not touching and our look back period is only four bars because we're looking for four bars in a row. All right, and let's see the output style. Most people like to use the digital output style. Um, so, right, the analog is by default and you can see that what happens is when, when the bars um, are on one side of the EMA or the other side, you can see that the output starts um, in increasing, right? So as we get to that fourth bar, then we get that signal output, uh, right? So that's just the fuzzy logic, and you, so it kind of provides you a way of of visualizing, you know, the, the how many bars, um, you know, as 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 we get each new bar that's not touching. Right, the the output of our signal counter is going to increase by a little bit, but most people like to use the digital, so that way you just get a nice, clean, easy to see output. So now, when we get a short or a long output, we know that we have at least four bars in a row. There's the first bar, that's above, second bar above, third bar above, and then the fourth bar above our EMA, we start getting a long output. And then as soon as right the bar touches the EMA, then the output stops. Oh, so actually, you know, I just, yeah. Okay, so we're looking at this. So when we get, you know, four bars basically clearing the EMA, right, the signal is gonna be on the bar that actually touches the EMA. So for yeah, so for example, right, those two bars, right? So yeah, the last um, yeah, so signal on a touch, right, or a retouch of the EMA, right? The signals on on the bar basically touching the EMA, but we can see that there's no output on the bar that touches the EMA. Right, so we need to get, you know, we need to get this output, you know, of, you know, we need to get the signals that are telling us that the bars have cleared, you know, we've got four bars in a row that have cleared the EMAs. We need to take that output and shift it forward one bar onto the bar that actually touches the EMA. Um, and so to do that, I actually need a look back node to do that. So instead of using two nodes, <laughs> I'm actually gonna yeah just get rid of the signal counter and just use a look back node here. So with the look back node, it has a dis displacement function built into it, and that's what we need. This displacement essentially takes the signal and shifts it forward x number of bars here but also the look back node so i'm going to set this to look back four bars and uh, we want a minimum of four bars clearing yeah minimum of four bars clearing the ema right so you can see that basically we have the same results as as that signal counter However, with the look back node, now pay attention, right? The, the signals right now, the output is not on the signal bar, 
right? So remember, we got the signal bar here and the signal bar here. But if I set my displacement, if I set that back to one, then you can see the output all shifted to the right, right? It shifted forward one bar. And so now we actually have a signal on the bar that touches there. So that's what we need. So, all right. So let's see. Let's give this a, a name here. Um, all right. So this is this look back note is basically identifying a four bar four bar minimum and uh, a displacement of one there. All right, so we can hook that in to the AND node. There we go. Mm. And unfortunately, it looks like, you know, the bars that I had marked, those EMAs had sloped, started sloping in the wrong direction. So, you know, we can actually see that those are actually not going to be signal bars. Um, here we go. Yeah, so we're going to get a signal there. And we will get another signal there. And it looks like we will get another signal there. Yeah. Uh, no. Sorry, 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 that's wrong. Nope, we won't get a signal there because the EMA started sloping up and so our output turned off, yeah. So, all right, well, at least we got two spots that we can work with here. So now we can start focusing on rule number four is looking for basically the touch of that EMA. Um, and so to do that uh, let's see here we we will need another comparison solver and so just like this comparison solver right this comparison solver is identifying when the bar is completely below or completely above our EMA um, so basically this solver is going to identify really when, when a bar uh, straddles that EMA, right? When that bar is touching the EMA. So uh, let's see, let's move this back there. All right, so this time when a bar is touching the EMA, right? So it, for a short situation, the high is going to be above the moving average, but the low of the bar is going to be below the moving average. So let's see here. So we want, yeah. So in a long situation, the low, the low of the bar is gonna be below and in the short situation, the high price of the bar will be above. All right, so we have a name here. Yeah. There. All right, so now let's set our prices into input A. So for a long, we're looking at the low. And for a short situation, we're looking at the high price and input B that needs to be our EMA 18. There you go. EMA make it an 18 period. Call it good. All right. So now we need to look at the outputs here. So we actually need to reverse these outputs. So I'm turning them off. So for, for a short output, right, for a short signal here, the high needs to be above uh, the EMA, right? So in other words, for that output, 
A is going to be greater than B, right? So what is what is A? Well, A is the high price, right? The high needs to be greater than the EMA. So that's the output we're looking for, like so. Now, if if it's uh, if if it's okay if the high just uh, touches the EMA, then what we can do is turn on these outputs as well. So we can go down to A equals B, right? And that means um, the high price can equal the EMA, and that would be considered a touch as well. And so I'll just leave those on like that there. All right. Um, so there we go. So when the high right, goes above the EMA, we're getting a short output there. Yeah, here we go. So back here, right, the wick of the bar on both of these bars went above uh, the EMA, right? So there you go, there's the bar touching. And so we can now take this, and squish this up here so we can see what's going on. I'll squish that up. All right, so as soon as I connect this guy up, the final step here, and that basically cleans up all the signals there. All right, let's take a quick look and see if there's any issues here. All right, so there's the beginning of the chart. All right, some nice, clean-looking signals. And um, let's take a look at this here. Um, yeah, there you go. Not, not too bad. Um, hmm, it looks like... We might be missing a signal there. Let's zoom in there. Let's see, it, it looks like the EMAs are sloping up. So, we're going to go through a little uh, debug process here and find out, you know, why isn't there a signal here? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check the slope of the EMAs. So that one's sloping up. So the EMA 20 is sloping up. So let's check the EMAs on the 15 minute chart. Hmm. Yeah, they're all sloping up. And here we go. So the, what happened? Oh, here we go. Yeah. So I discovered a little mistake I made, right? So the solver here that's, uh, remember this last one here is detecting the touch. Well, look at here, input A, price type long. I set it to the last price by accident. So that was wrong. There we go. So let's correct that. We'll put it on the low price and voila. There we go. So now we have a long output when, right, when the bar touches that EMA. So now let's take a look here at the signals. And there's our signal. Okay. So let's close that out. Let's take a look again here. So we were basically none of the long bounces signals would have shown up. And yeah, so there we go. So there's a bunch of long signal bounces right there. So, all right. So yeah, those all look good. Uh, hmm, let's zoom in here, see what, 
this has. And yeah, so price did not quite touch that EMA. If you look here, so a couple of signals were missing. Let's do this. All right, so that looked like that should have been or could have been a signal, but guaranteed price did not quite touch that EMA. And same thing there. Price did not quite. This one's actually a little easier to see that price didn't touch. Um, yeah, if I zoom in, <clears throat> yeah, if we really stretch things out a lot, yeah, we can see that price did not quite touch. And same thing on here, right? That bar did not quite touch that EMA. So, you know, if you want to make a little exception for those bars that are not quite touching, what you can do is, right, the solver that's detecting the touch, um, and if we want, there we go, we can just kind of add, add to the name of the solver there that this is the touch guy here. Um, what we can do is we can add a difference amount in here. So, you know, we could put, say, maybe, maybe price needs to get within like a quarter of a tick. And that's close enough. And let's see if we get a signal. Uh, no. We still did not get a signal. Even with, with a quarter of a tick. So, um, let's try half a tick. Let's see if half a tick will do. Hmm, no. All right, I'm checking the slopes of the EMAs here. Yeah. So apparently those bars are more than half a tick away. Let's try three quarters of a tick. And still <clears throat> nothing. Wow, I wonder just how far those are. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so though <clears throat> so they're just over a tick away. Uh, let's see, am I reading that right? Yeah, they're just over a tick away. Mm. Yeah, let's see. Two ticks should do it. Um. Well, let me see what's going on here. Okay, well, there we go. Wow, five ticks. Um, hmm. Let's see, I'm on the NQ. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was counting in points, not ticks. Okay, yeah, so they are five ticks away. Um, yeah, one and a quarter points, so that's five ticks. All right, yeah, my... Uh, 
Yeah, I was just counting wrong. So I was doing the math in points and not converting it correctly to ticks. Yeah, so those are five ticks away from each other. All right, that makes sense. There we go. So there is no problem. It's just my my math conversion. That was the problem there. So yeah, so there we go. So those what looked like were touches were in fact five ticks away from each other there. Um, yeah, on those two bars there. So yeah, but the so the point I wanted to make here was, you know, if you wanted to kind of make, you know, uh, an allowance there so that the price didn't actually have to, so, you right, so the, the bar doesn't actually have to cross over the EMA or, you know, penetrate through the EMA. You know, you could just say, well, if price gets close to my EMA, that's good enough. And so you can, you know, you can put that distance in, in the difference section. And so if you read this, now for these short signals, it says A equals B within five ticks. So in other words, the high of the bar just has to get within five ticks of the EMA 18. And that's, you know, close enough, basically, right? So, yeah, so you can, you can adjust that, this solver here for that to allow some kind of variance here. But I will set it back to zero so that it complies with uh, the rules that we have here. Right, so there you go. All right, well, uh, with that, we are basically done. And yep, you guys had spotted already that I put last in the solver. Good catch there. And yeah, it looks like you guys are catching all my mistakes. <laughs> all right, so David would just like to add a MACD filter to this. Yeah, so simply uh, for, uh, for a long, yeah, the MACD needs to be above zero. And for short uh, signals, the MACD needs to be below zero. All right, yep, simple enough. So I'm going to go to the solver nodes, go to the default time frame. So if you want to analyze the MACD on the 15 minute time frame, then we could just go to the 15 minute time frame and grab a threshold solver from the 15 minute. We're going to do this on the default time frame. So we'll just grab a threshold solver. And we'll connect that in. And give this a name. All right, so we just want to see, we're going to check if the MACD is above or below the zero line. So our input, that's going to be the MACD indicator. There's the MACD. And of course, remember to change your periods if you want to use different periods there, guys. And let's see, the MACD plot is, is already selected for us, so we're good to go. And we want to see if it's above or below the zero value, right? The zero line is a zero value. And so if the MACD is above it, right, we want a long output. If the MACD is below the zero line, we want a short output. Right, so there we go. So that just tells us if the MACD is above or below the zero line. So we can take that <clears throat> and... Connect that in like that. All right, let's see if. Yeah, so I'm just kind of seeing if uh, any signals were filtered out from this. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. We might get we might get some of these signals filtered here. Let's see here. Let's connect that in. Nope. They all stayed. Yeah. 
And here we go. Let's check these. Nope, all those remained as well. All right. Well, you know, so just on a really quick superficial look, um, doesn't look like the MACD is adding any filtering, but that is how you would do it. So if you want to add a MACD filter to anything, just simply grab a threshold solver, right? Plug in your MACD indicator and, you know, all the, the threshold values are just going to be left at zero for the zero line. And then for the long output, you know, you want greater than A. And for the short output, you want less than E. Yeah, so there you go. Pretty straightforward there. Okay, so there you go, David. And, oh, yeah, sorry, David. Um, all right, the last part of his question, he's saying, um, yeah, David's asking if it was a BlackBerry question. So um, let's see here, right? The last part is uh, setting a limit order um, on these signals. So actually, we could do this with Raven here. The Yeah, so this uh, part six here, setting the limit order. Um, yeah, th this was the missing information here, David, that I needed from you. Um, you never said where that limit order gets placed. You know, if you submit a limit order, you have to tell the exchange what price you want that limit order at, you know, or, you know, whereabouts. So, um, all right. So if you just want to set that limit order on, say, the closing price, um, so you want to set the limit order on the EMA 18. Okay. Yeah, that will require Blackbird. To place the order on an indicator will require Blackbird. But if you want to place a limit order based on the close of the bar, so let's zoom in here, guys. Um, so we'll take this, this um, uh, let's see here. No, we'll take this long signal here, for example. Um, yeah, so with Raven, we can place a limit order based on the closing price of the signal bar. So if we open up, if we open up our strategies window here, and go into the Shark Indicators folder, and if I add Raven down here, so under the entry order options here, so let me close everything else, close everything up here. Yeah, so in the entry order options, we have we can use a limit order, so you can check that. <clears throat> and then there is a offset from entry, um, right? So um, actually, I guess this would be this would be better if it says offset from close close price. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a little more precise. But so the offset, um, so you can set a offset distance from the closing price of the signal bar. Um, so if um, let's see, yeah. So if with this being a long signal, if we wanted to set a limit order, uh, say three ticks below the closing price, then we would put a negative three. And that would be three ticks below the closing price. So basically, if you're using a negative number, that is gonna give you a better uh, entry price. So regardless of it being long or short. So for this for this short signal here, a negative three is actually going to place the limit order three ticks above the closing price, right? Because if you're going short, if you get into the trade at a higher price going short, right, that's a better entry fill, right? Or that's a better entry price. So again, negative numbers will give you better entry prices um, and positive numbers will give you worse entry prices. Right. So, yeah. so again, if it's a short, 
a negative number is actually going to go three ticks above the closing price because for a short trade, three ticks higher would be a better entry price. So, so anyways, yeah, so it, placing a limit order can be done with Raven, but it's going to be based off the closing price of the signal bar. Yeah, so if you want to set your limit order at the EMA, um, as Richard wants to do, then, um, I'm sorry, as David wants to do, then uh, we'll have to use Blackbird, yeah, to place that limit order on um on an indicator value. So, all right.